There is no time machine to take us back 100 plus years to a period and place in Fort Worth packed with vices and an anything goes spirit. Instead, it's the stories of what is known as Hell's Half Acre that give us a window into what life would have looked like all those years ago. And for the last month, journalist Ken Molestina dug deep into those stories to share some of the many sinful tales from the acre. This is Hell's Half Acre, a CBS 11, CBSN, Dallas, Fort Worth original. everyone, thank you so much for joining us for this CBSN Dallas Fort Worth special Hell's Half Acre. I'm Ken Molestina. You know, it really is hard to believe that Fort Worth has so much CD history. But within the next half hour, we hope to give you a closer look at what life would have been like inside Hell's Half Acre and what ultimately led to its demise. It's an inherent tension at Fort Worth that we have a, a district like the Acre. The area known as Hell's Half Acre was actually larger than its name suggests. It would have been unofficially bound by Throckmorton and Jones Street on the west and east sides, by Lancaster over on the south end, ninth or so on the north side. But the kind of activity that took place here would have extended to where Sundance Square sits today. Time period would have been 1870s to about 1920. Hell's Half Acre originally emerged uh, from the major cattle drives that would come through Fort Worth, uh, very much kind of catering to the things that the cowboys wanted. You come in off of the railroad and then you find your way into it. And according to local historian Brendan Smart, those things the cowboys wanted didn't agree with the Victorian values of the time. Drinking establishments, gambling, dance halls, and prostitution. The Acre had it all on every single block and every corner. It's human nature at a high pitch. First, it was the cowboys moving north that indulged, later railroad men, and in some cases, even business folks who would travel to Fort Worth from time to time. In some ways, you can think of Hell's Half Acre as being a bit like Las Vegas. I mean, it's a, it's a place uh, very much catering uh, to a human desire for, for adventure. Historians agree the acre was Fort Worth's dirty but widely known secret, a wild red light district. Even with laws on the books prohibiting most of the activity, the illegal and oftentimes dangerous pastimes went unchecked, mainly because enforcement was abysmal and, well... The reality of, of the time uh, was that business kind of came first. It brought the city of Fort Worth a lot of money in those early days and in the decades that followed, mainly through fines, payoffs, and some legitimate transactions. Sometimes those laws are simply being enforced to collect fines and fees that in essence were paying for lawmen's salaries. And this town has survived and thrived because it has a whole lot of hustle. The acre, packed with its loose morals, thrived for about 50 years. While it had plenty of iterations throughout, the main attractions were always free-flowing booze, gambling, and lots of dates with women of the night. As Smart put it, male patrons would have some conversation and some company. All of it really ended with one outcome, separating the men in the acre from the money in their pockets. It really was just an absolutely wild place. Now, coming up, when we return, we're going to introduce you to the madams, the prostitutes, and the brothels that also played a role in shaping the history of Hell's Half Acre. Hey, did you know TCU was almost built one street over from Hell's Half Acre until the founding Clark brothers realized what actually took place there? Then they, well, decided to head to the city south side. Hello everyone and welcome back to CBSN Dallas Fort Worth special Hell's Half Acre. I'm Ken Molestina. You know, Fort Worth's long gone red light district, the Acre, catered to so many different kinds of vices, but it's specifically prostitution and brothels that carved out its own kind of history during that era. 
Here's the story of the so-called soiled doves. Body houses, bordellos, or simply brothels. What you called them didn't matter. The only thing that did was the money being made inside the sex houses of Hell's Half Acre. Cowboys, gamblers, businessmen, politicians, and even shady lawmen all reportedly indulged at all hours of the day and night. I would say the word rampant. The quote you see frequently used in um, newspapers of the day is that Fort Worth was a wide open town. That this used to be, you know, a thriving, thriving red light district. Dr. Jessica Webb is a TCU trained historian who researched the Acres madams and sex workers as part of her dissertation. She says it's hard to know exactly how many women worked in the trade because they didn't always keep their names on records, but she does know many of them did it willingly. The women working in the Acre for the most part were, um, were women choosing to do so. Dr. Webb explains the kind of money these women could make was astronomical for the time and an easy lure if your morals were less than pure. The men were serviced in mainly three types of segregated establishments. On the high end, you had a parlor house with all the amenities and the comforts of the time. A date there could be anywhere between five to $10. Then there were mid-tier brothels or boarding homes, a little smaller, less luxurious, where some company would go for about a dollar. At the very bottom were street side shacks known as cribs. Cribs are um, one room houses that you would rent by the day. Dates there were about a quarter. Dr. Webb says the activity wasn't legal, but they weren't stopped either, except when it came to the occasional arrest of madams. They'd pay a fine, many times they'd be out of jail within hours and right back to business. The city council, the police department in Fort Worth saw this fines and fees system as um, as a way of enforcement, right? So it's still legal, they're still doing it, but oh, well, we're arresting them. That money led to economic development in the early days, and knowing they had that kind of cash made those madams powerful and influential. They have this sway because they know that they are important to the city, even if they are kept removed from the rest of the city because of what they do. You know, these stories of the prostitutes and madams, they stem from Hell's Half Acre, but it is here, three miles away at Oakwood Cemetery, that their final chapter lies. This area is believed to be the resting place of five different madams, most notably Mary Porter. It's known as Soil Doves Row. Unless she rose to become a madam herself, the life of a prostitute was usually one of rapid decline. By about the age of 30, they would find themselves on the outs, and it wasn't uncommon for them to commit suicide. For a lot of these women, especially those that are reported on, is they're leaving notes, and they're saying, you know, I, I'm, you know, I'm despairing, I'm, I'm distraught, I can't do this. For decades, the sex houses maintained a symbiotic relationship with the Acre. It all came to a close around 1920 after a massive effort to make Fort Worth what they called at the time, morally clean. You might be asking yourself, what's a red light district without a lot of free flowing booze and some gaming? Well, you know, aside from prostitution, there was plenty of gambling and a whole lot of alcohol that contributed to the Acre's reputation. To understand why Hell's Half Acre catered to so many vices, you have to understand what the goal of the place was. A sinful, raunchy time was the vehicle used to separate John's gamblers and drunks from all of their money. Just ask Richard Seltzer. But I'm the man that wrote the book on whoring, gambling, and drinking uh, in Fort Worth. His book, Hell's Half Acre, published more than 20 years ago and is still widely circulated. He says those scratching their itch with vices were less than proper people. Nobody took baths. Um, there was no air conditioning. Um, nobody used deodorant. Um, very few brushed their teeth. And those are the kind of people that were there. Acre activities always began with drinking and maybe even a little dancing. Rot gut, whiskey, and warm beer is about all you could find at the bar, but the patrons didn't seem to mind. If you came in with money, um, you went up to the bar, they served you a knockout drink. And when you woke up, if you woke up still alive, you were out in the back alley behind the bar uh, without any money. 
And if you were looking for a game or two, there was plenty to be had. In a fancier uptown establishment, the gaming halls were known as gambling concessions, invite only and with pro gamblers. But down on the acre, it was a whole lot different. But when you're down on the acre, uh, it was a back room, and they pointed you back there, and you went to the back room and uh, gambled. The games were called Pharaoh, Monty, and Kino, all games of chances and almost always rigged. If you didn't know how to play Pharaoh, didn't know how to do Kino, didn't know what Monty was, maybe you did sit down at the table and do a five card stud. Or, and just like drinking, and whatever money you take, you, you take out, you've got, and uh, pretty soon you don't have any money. And then pretty soon after that, you find yourself in the back alley. You know, this spot here, Throckmorton Street, would have been the western edge of the acre. And interestingly enough, for the 50 years that all of that raucous activity took place on this side of the street, they had a visual reminder of all of their sin and debauchery by way of the St. Patrick's Cathedral. Cathedral's still standing, but the acre obviously is long gone. Drugs weren't really a big deal in the acre, according to Seltzer. When they did make a presence, it was usually morphine or opium. But in the early 1900s, drugs were, were legal. There was nothing illegal. You could go down to any pharmacist and get opium or morphine or anything else you wanted. They don't become illegal till 1913. And all of this money being made on the vices ultimately ended up bankrolling many city accounts. All the money they spent in the acre, some of it's going to wind up, well, number one in the business, but in city coffers uh, one way or the other. Cash spent on vices turned into economic fuel for the city. You know, it's kind of hard to imagine what a hangover would have felt like in those days. I bet it was very unpleasant. Hey, stick around because coming up, we're going to take a much closer look at some of the violence and some of the more famous gun battles that took place down on the acre. All of it, of course, contributing to its infamy. Stay with us. The famed White Elephant Saloon originally had two different locations in Hell's Half Acre. But after years of dormancy, it moved to its current location in the stockyards where it has stood since the 1970s. Welcome back, everyone. You know, by the early 1900s, the acre was already wildly popular for its boozing, its gambling, its prostitution, really that entire rash atmosphere down there. But along with the wild entertainment came a whole lot of violence. You can't talk about Hell's Half Acre without mentioning how dangerous of a place it was. There were killings and stabbings and violence every night, all night in the acre. And Christmas. Richard Seltzer is an author and historian who has written and studied these tales at length. Every bartender had a gun and a mallet behind the bar, and if the mallet didn't take care of an obstreperous customer, the gun would. You could say this kind of behavior was to be expected. There were, however, several other stories that stood out then and are still talked about today, like that time in 1892 when police officer Lee Waller had a shootout with a man he believed was involved with his paramour. And approached each other and pulled their guns and opened fire. Just on the open street at night. Officer Waller was killed. Several gunfights involving lawmen and outlaws played out similarly, and a handful happened along 12th Street in Commerce. Perhaps the most famed gun battle is the 1887 story of gambler Luke Short and former Fort Worth Marshal Jim Longhaired Courtright. This is the one story that gets told over and over and over again. This is what everybody wants to know about. That deadly encounter took place a few blocks north of the acre on Main Street, just outside the old White Elephant Saloon. Their beef stemmed from Courtright being upset that Short wouldn't pay him extortion money for what he called protection. Courtright's anger boiled over one night, and he decided to go pull Short out of the gambling hall he ran. Because you can't have this little pipsqueak gambler showing you up if you're a noted gunfighter. They exchanged words outside, and Short was first to pull a gun out of his jacket. Short put about five bullets, emptied his pistol into Jim Courtright. Uh, Courtright got one pistol out, and one of the shots took off his thumb. One of the shots apparently hit the pistol, and he went down. Short was arrested, but never charged. It was simply chalked up to a couple of men settling a difference. 
When Luke Short died in 1893, he was brought back here to the Oakwood Cemetery to be buried. Interestingly enough, only about 100 yards away from Jim Courtright himself. Courtright's headstone says he was a U.S. Army scout, a marshal, and a frontiersman. But most that know his name know him as the antagonist former Fort Worth lawman who died in a drunken gunfight. Of course, all of this lawlessness, it wouldn't go on forever. There were so many efforts to try and dismantle the acre, but all of them failed. Then finally, after thriving for 50 years, the acre was no more. As the saying goes, all things must come to an end, even the good times for all those who treated Hell's Half Acre as an adult playground lacking morals and judgment alike. Through its lifespan, the acre had several iterations where attempts to shut it down were made. There's always been, I guess, the question of where do you draw the line and how do you draw the line? Local historian Brendan Smart says the look of Hell's Half Acre changed a few times, but the boozing, the gambling, and the prostitution were always there until its final demise. At the end of the day, what really cleaned up the acre uh, was World War I. The arrival of Camp Bowie to Fort Worth meant the acre would be ordered dismantled. The United States the Department of Defense made it their policy that no vice would be tolerated within a certain amount of distance of an army camp. Raids, mass arrests, evictions, and even some tearing down of structures became commonplace. By 1920, the area known as the Acre was declared to be morally clean. The things that had made the Acre exciting had kind of come to a natural close or moved elsewhere. While some of the activity popped up in different parts of town, like Jacksboro Highway, the reality was the Acre and what it was known for had seen its final days. By 1960, the few structures left from the time were finally bulldozed, making way for Fort Worth's modern downtown plans. In 1968, the Fort Worth Convention Center would be built right in the middle of where it all happened. A few years later, the popular water gardens would also be built here, an attraction that is part marvel for those who see it and part symbolism for those who know the history of this place and the efforts to keep it clean. If we look at it, we see water kind of washing things away everywhere you look. So, I mean, I think that there was probably a conscious effort to erase some of that history. To date, a few plaques around the area commemorate the stories of the acre. There's also the Wild Bunch Inlay Monument featuring Butch Cassidy's outlaw gang next to the flat iron building. But aside from some markers, the real stories of the acre live on through walking tours and research by historians who just can't get enough of it. For bad... There are definite um, depressing aspects to studying this. Or for good... There is a real hunger for people to connect with the, the deeper history of a place. In a way, again, it's how, at the end of the day, we know ourselves. The appeal is magic. You know, we've had such a great time taking this deep dive into this small portion of Fort Worth's history, and we certainly hope that you also enjoyed it too. That's going to do it for this CBSN Dallas Fort Worth special, Hell's Half Acre. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Ken Molestina. Take care, everyone.